Good evening. My name is Calvin Carr, and I'm a graduate student here at San Jose State in the uh, School of Journalism and Mass Communications. I'm pleased to uh, introduce tonight's speaker for our uh, new media visionary ser lecture series. Joaquin Ruiz is the founder and CEO of Catalog Spree, which is the number one shopping app on the Apple App Store. Joaquin has an undergraduate degree in computer engineering and a master's degree in electrical engineering. And he has his MBA from uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He started his career at HP as the worldwide marketing manager for their high availability solutions. And he moved on to various marketing and product roles in uh, startup companies like Sistina Software, Zimbra, and Gear 6. He's uh, served as the entrepreneur in residence at El Dorado Ventures, which is a private equity VC firm. In May of 2010, he founded Catalog Spree a month after uh, the first Apple iPad started shipping. And uh, now the Catalog Spree app has uh, recently won the iVillage 2012 Best App Award, along with many other accolades. So please join me in uh, welcoming Joaquin uh, as uh, he shares his insights on being an entrepreneur in new media. Thanks, Thanks Calvin. Um, thank you for having me here at San Jose State. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of my experience in entering this uh, new world of uh, media, if you will. Uh, this was a, a deliberate, um, how would I say, a deliberate uh, decision I made in 2010. I had seen a lot of things changing uh, in, the, in the mid to late 90s with regards to the internet. I had been in a lot of startups that sold infrastructure software and infrastructure software services and web applications uh, to consumers and to businesses. And I just saw the growth there. And one of the things that struck me when the iPhone came out was this was not a enterprise device. This was a consumer device. And when you're talking about consumer devices and cell phones, the market potential there is in the billions, not in the millions anymore. So I thought the, the game had changed. Uh, around the same time uh, that year, the Kindle was launched. And I don't know if you remember when the Kindle was launched, but uh, most people thought that Amazon had gone insane because now they were shipping a hardware product, and why would you do that? Um, they weren't a hardware company. And it really was because the world was going to change. So before I get into all that, let me just bring up the talk about uh, disruptions in the marketplace and how it affects media. Now, there's many examples. I'm just showing you a little timeline up here of different... Uh, media disruptions that have happened. Probably the most uh, famous one that almost brought an entire industry down on its knees uh, was the disruption in the music industry. Um, if you look at the, the CD, the CD brought sales of music uh, way up there in the late 90s and through the uh, 2000s. But then um, around 2000, 2001, uh, you started basically at the dot-com uh, bubble burst. Uh, there was many services out there for media sharing, file sharing, Napster being probably the, the uh, most popular of them. And people started to refuse to pay for music because there was no good distribution mechanism for music. They didn't want to go to the stores and buy this ancient platter that you know I used to think was hot. It was optical. It was laser. Oh my god. And it was so clear. But people didn't want to bother with that. So they started, if you will, sharing, uh, i.e. pirating music. And the music industry in Los Angeles you know, felt it uh, big time. And uh, at that point, uh, uh, well, I guess a serial, serial entrepreneur who was no longer really an entrepreneur, but a CEO of a reviving Cupertino-based company went down to LA and struck a whole bunch of contracts with these companies to distribute their music legally on a service that happened to have a device that was just made available called the iPod. And so that was Apple. And then all of a sudden, iTunes, which is a piece of software that was meant to rip CDs. I don't know if people remember what ripping CDs was, but you 
could just uh, basically duplicate your CD and put it onto your computer and play it off of your computer. Now that became a store where you could legally buy music for 99 cents a song, roughly. Uh, so you went all the way from an industry that was mature, that had very uh, decent distribution channels with the LPs, which that uh, seamlessly lead to the CD, and then all of a sudden the world fell apart because people were just you know, taking music for free. They really wanted to buy it. They wanted to own the music, and the Apple showed them that if you give the people an experience, not just a device, not just a gadget, but a service that delivered that product to the device and allowed you to consume it the way you wanted to, people would buy it. And they did, and thus was born, if you will, the, the legal digital music downloading phenomenon that now, now most people are downloading uh, music onto their devices, whether it be their computers, their iPads, their iPods, their Android devices, uh, etc. This has been repeated, so this is not a single event. This has been repeated over and over and over again, uh, whether it be in the commerce area, when the internet... Uh, well, when the catalog first came into, into maturity in the late 1800s to into the 1900s, and now all of a sudden the internet as a, as a purchasing um, store, if you will, virtual store, came into effect in the late 90s and then in the uh, 2000s. Uh, there are retailers, there are companies that don't take those disruptions seriously. They let other people take advantage of them, and they ultimately lose out. Because as the great one once said, uh, Wayne Gretzky, you have to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And a lot of companies are you know, very entrenched, and they have people that are trying to protect their own jobs, and they're not thinking about where the consumer is going to be or where the consumer wants to be. They're thinking of what they've done in the past. And thus, you know, cycles continue, and you know, it allows smaller companies, uh, more nimble companies, to take advantage of that and then become big companies later. So this has happened in the area of books. Uh, I remember, because I'm a geek, reading books on CRT tubes, so not flat screens, you know, CRT tubes. I remember reading the, the Mars books, the Diego Rice Burroughs books on those things. Of course, I'm the only one that did that. When, when Amazon launched its service, they provided a device that weighed something like a book had batteries that you didn't have to have it plugged in all the time, and you had good screen resolution. And you know there had been other providers in the electronic book front for years. No one wanted to read a book on a computer. That's not a leisurely activity. You know, you're not going to lean forward with a keyboard looking. They're not going to do that. They want to lean back either on their bed, in the couch, on the sofa, outside, on the on a chair, in the train. So. Amazon did the, the best thing. They provided a service that digitally distributed the books and the device upon which you read it. So not just the device. There's a lot of, there were a lot of manufacturers like Sony and Franklin, if you remember that, that were providing devices but no service. And not just the service because no one wanted the user experience of reading a bloody book on a computer leaning forward. It's not relaxing. Um, and the same thing is happening now in the magazine industry. So we're sitting there in 2010. And the world is about to change again. And we got privy into some numbers that really inspired us. So ultimately, the iPad is what we were aiming at. But what inspired us first were the numbers that we saw. I don't know if you can see this uh, well, but uh, this is the timeline of Amazon when it started shipping uh, books in, uh, 80, sorry, in, in 96. So again, Amazon was thought of as a bit ahead of its time and perhaps potentially a little crazy. Uh, they started shipping books, and there's almost no volume of books. People were look, looking at what was available online, what the prices were, and then they would go to um, Barnes & Noble, I guess, and buy a book. Or what was the other one that uh, just went under last year? Borders. They would go to Borders and, and buy their book. Anyways, they distributed exclusively paper-based books for years. And you see their growth there in the yellow line. You know, they were growing along very nicely, and then all of a sudden, once they had concentrated on the book business long enough, they started to expand into clothes and other items that were a little more challenging to do up front. Books were, you know, there's few para fewer parameters to mess up with uh, with regards to books. Anyways, 2008-ish, uh, they launched their Kindle service. They produced these hardware devices that you can start reading books on. 2010, early 2010, I'm around and I'm, I'm like, I'm hearing data with regards to how many Kindle books are shipping. 
And so I can do math. I know that by the end of the year, they're going to start shipping more Kindle books than they ship all books, period. That's huge. This is a company that just started shipping paper books and nothing else. And in just a couple of years, as you can see the intersection of the orange and the yellow lines, they were going to start shipping in Christmas of 2010 was the first time it happened. 2011, they just blew past it. More Kindle books than physical books. I, I, for me, that was mind boggling. It wasn't, we, they weren't quite there yet, but it was clear the intersection was going to happen. Um, so Amazon had proved that in a publication industry, they could change the paradigm, get more people to read more books and consume you know, more, which is always good from a retailer perspective, uh, still sell paper books. They're still selling paper books, both you know, soft cover and hard cover, but clearly they were on a trend. And meanwhile, other companies ignored the trend and you know, they suffered the, the consequences. And then Apple was about to launch the iPad, and they did launch the iPad. And when we saw the specs for the iPad and then saw the iPad, we said, game over. Um, the world has changed. It wasn't game over for Amazon. It was game over for the PC. The PC was done. People didn't know yet. Um, and the reason PC, the PC is, is done, and I'll get into in a couple of uh, slides here, but uh, was obvious to us in, in 2010. Um, so it's my assertion that it is already a mobile world. And when I say mobile, just to be clear, I don't mean just smartphones, so mobile phones. I mean smartphones and tablets. In the future, it could just be smartphones uh, or other devices that, uh, like glasses, you've probably seen the Google Glasses, um, or other small devices like that. But for today, I'm talking about uh, smartphones and tablets when I say mobile. Um, so my assertion is that it already is that. So 2011 was the first year that smartphones outshipped personal computers. So there was uh, nearly half a billion smartphone units uh, that were sold. Uh, and the 350 million PCs. Now, the PC is an industry that started in the late 70s, 70s by Apple Computer and um, who was it? Commodore, and there was a couple of others. Uh, what was the other one? Tandy. Tandy was a big one. Then IBM <laughs> came into the market in 81. So it was a mature market. 350 million units is not bad. Uh, 492 million smartphones. All right, so that means everyone on the planet Earth has a smartphone. Well, the answer is no. Uh, everyone on this planet Earth doesn't have a smartphone, and smartphones are bought about once every two years, depending on what sort of model of phone you buy. So in 2016, uh, which used to sound like science fiction to me, but now is no longer science fiction, um, in a couple of more years, there's going to be 1.6 billion new smartphones shipped that year, new, brand new, bought, um, and about half a billion PCs. All right, so just the smartphone itself all right, that's enough. The, the PC is dead. Um, if you don't believe that, so two and a half years ago, yeah, two and a half years ago, at the end of this month, uh, another device was introduced, a general purpose computing device called a iPad. Uh, and if you remember when that was launched in 2010, the analysts were saying maybe a million maybe three million units would ship. You know, the, the ones that were on uh, mind-altering uh, drugs were thinking maybe three million units would ship uh, that year because why would someone need a tablet, right? Like, there, there was no use case. Well, they were clearly incorrect because Apple had built up already hundreds of thousands of apps for the phone that would run on the tablet. Um, it is growing 19 times faster than the PC market, and that's easy because the PC market is growing roughly at zero. So 19 times is an easy number, and I think that's going to accelerate. There were already more tablets sold by uh, Apple last quarter than any single company shipped computers. There were 17 million tablets sold last quarter just by Apple, just Apple. And that beat the unit numbers for any computer company on the planet. Um, it's growing 60% faster than smartphones, so it took, it took them less than two-thirds the time to ship the same number of units, to hit a million units, to hit 10 million units, that the iPhone did. And the iPhone was previously the fastest shipping product on the planet in terms of uh, user penetration. Um, by 2016, 126 million tablets will be used in uh, the US. And I'll have, so 
All right, so when you add in smartphones and these devices, I mean, the PC's dead. People don't know it. And, and, I, and I've started talks before and saying, you know, I'm very happy with this laptop. It has this SSD. It boots up in four seconds, runs Windows, runs Linux, runs everything. On the, I'm very proud of it. I, sh I introduce it as my tele Telefunken. Does anyone know what a Telefunken is? That's the point. It, it, it's, it's gone. Um, I remember when I was a young boy in Madrid and I saw my grandmother's radio. It was a vacuum tube radio from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I was like, what is that? That's a radio. And of course, when I was a child, a radio was a transistor thing that you could carry around. Uh, this is a telephone. This is gone. Um, and the reason is people say, oh, I'll need my keyboard. All right, get a keyboard. Oh, I'll need a bigger screen. OK, get a bigger screen. But the compute capacity, memory capacity, bandwidth capacity will fit on your phone roughly now. The software isn't quite there to do it. Now, app, uh, Microsoft just introduced their, um, their Surface tablet. And that will run basically any application on the Windows side. So why do you need the laptop? My assertion is that you won't in a couple of years. And maybe in about five years, people will, will realize that. So this, is, this has disrupted many industries. And so you know, I, as an entrepreneur, looking at this in 2010 and looking at what industries uh, get disrupted. And you know, one of the industries that gets disrupted every time there's a shift in the technology is retail. Why is retail disrupted? Because there's a lot of, a lot of consumers, especially in the United States and Western Europe and, and uh, in Asia, that are consistently buying. And so retail always gets a, you know, in, absorbs the disruption both negative, negatively and positively. Some people uh, embrace the change, and some people resist the change. Those that resist long enough eventually become part of history. And those people who embrace the change and get it right, mostly, or learn from it, and then you know, optimize the user experience, uh, they benefit from it. So you know, Amazon was thought of as nuts for years. No one would use their credit card in Amazon. They used it as a referral service as to find what products you want. and then walk into the store. And I remember having, working at Hewlett Packard in the mid 90s, having a executive from a major retailer tell me at Hewlett Packard they didn't have to invest more into their web infrastructure because no one was ever going to buy on the web. They were just meant to be pushed into the store and to buy into the store. And I'm like, how? No, you have tens of millions of people that are going to be interacting on that site. Eventually, they're going to want to buy. Well, anyways, um, things change. So retailers are telling us, this was not in 2010, by the way. Retailers are telling us now that this is uh, the single largest disruption. This mobile change in the landscape is the single largest disruption they've seen uh, since the dot-com days. And their customers are demanding sort of mobile-centric solutions. Here's one data point. So uh, retailers now for the last 12 years, roughly, have been optimizing their email campaigns to be opened on PCs, right? So you get an email from your favorite retailer, I don't know, Nordstrom's, Neiman Marcus, whatever it is, Macy's, and you get an email on your PC. You double click, you get that email. It would have some sort of propaganda in there, some sort of uh, sale that was going on, some new fashions, whatever it was that they thought would capture your attention. You would click on that. And it would open up their website, and you'd have the experience. So retailers are telling me now, uh, this is a trend that we predicted a couple of years ago, that somewhere around 40% to, in some cases, in excess of 50% of their emails are no longer opened on PCs. They're opened on tablets and smartphones. But yet the sites aren't optimized for those devices. So the rates, what they call the conversion rates, which is the, the rate at which you either get pushed to do the action they want you to do, which is eventually buy either in the store or, or on the site, isn't necessarily as good as it used to be. They're actually going down a little bit because they haven't optimized uh, that experience. But uh, I believe that this is, in fact, correct. Clearly, I believe that. I started a whole company whose thesis was that, so I, I better believe it. Um, here's some data. So in uh, 2010, when we were we started the company, but we didn't launch the service until April of 2011. So, you know, when we we're talking to retailers in 2010, we we're like, how much, what percentage of your traffic is coming from the iPad? Like in August, September, they're like, nothing. There's nothing, there's no traffic coming from the iPad. 
and then uh, you're hitting December of 2010, well, what percentage is coming from mobile phones? You know, maybe a percent, maybe a little less than a percent. It's noise. You know, it's, it's nothing. Okay, so in December of 2011, so we'd already launched in April, um, they were seeing somewhere around 95, a little less than 95 percent of their traffic being generated off of a PC or a Mac. All right, so that was December of 2011. So four months later, in April of 2012, it's like 85%. So 85% of their traffic is being generated on a PC or a Mac. Everything else now is coming from a mobile device which was carrying just the few short quarters before that, 0%. So now it's 15. Okay, so we've done informal surveys in May and June. We've seen now up to 25% of the traffic is being generated off of mobile devices on their websites. Now the conversion rates are different depending on whether you're on a phone, on a tablet, or on a, on a PC. But now it's 25%. And if you go to some high-end retailers, they're saying it's in excess of 30% are on devices that aren't PCs. Just, this is just web browsing uh, on their, this is not even including app traffic. This is just browsing onto their sites. All right, so we now have retailers telling us that they're expecting maybe in the next three years that 51% of the traffic will be on mobile devices. So this is a huge disruption. Now take into account that the e-commerce uh, business in last year was roughly around $160 billion business just in the United States. All right, so this is, and it's growing faster than the other segments of the retail business. So this is a big deal. So here's one thing that's really just flabbergasting to me. So of if you just look at the mobile traffic, so if you throw away all the PC traffic and just look at the mobile traffic, so a device that didn't exist two and a half years ago is carrying half of all that traffic, all that web traffic to the retails, and that's the iPad. So forget about all the other tablets on the planet. Just the iPad is carrying about half of that traffic, and it's also growing the, the fastest. Now you're starting to get other tablets into the market that are, like for example, Google has put out a decent tablet uh, in a seven inch form factor, um, Amazon is reinvesting more in there. There's going to be a, dis a distribution or shift in the tablet market, but nonetheless, consumers are consuming more on tablets. And if you don't believe me, go back to the high schools or to the grammar schools, and uh, there's less and less use for this uh, sort of device. Now, gr granted, the productivity software isn't there yet for for these types of devices, but. It's getting there, so you can, you can, uh, you can plot it out. Uh, the other half of the traffic um, is generated on an iPhone or other, other being dominated by Android. Now, clearly, there's more Android devices being shipped in the United States today already, almost two to one. Um, but in terms of utilization, they're being shipped, but they're not being used to the same extent. So the, right now, the Apple owners are using data plans more in order to to access uh, those, uh, those services. Um, anyways, so a big shift. So here's some recent data. So I, I said that previously, just uh, some data points from, they were projecting in 2016. Well, these are data points just from uh, today. Um, 70 million, roughly, uh, users in the United States, so we're more than halfway to the predictions that were in the previous slide, are using tablet users. About 60% of them are on, 62% of them are on iPads in terms of units that are owned, not in terms of usage of the web, right? iPad dominates that. Um, and so that's quite a few, quite a few uh, tablets. And the entire US population is somewhere around 325 million, right? So there's about 150 million smartphone users. So, you know, we're, we're getting deeply uh, penetrated. What has that meant in terms of you know, consumption for even traditional web, if you will, traditional web companies? Well, if you look at the eBay last year, a quarter of their revenue was generated, and I, when I say generated, I mean it was transacted. And forget about on mobile. On a mobile app. So not even on a web, you know, not on Safari or not on the Android browser, but on, on an app. So that's a quarter. This year, those numbers, are, there's speculation that those numbers will hit to between a third and half. So if all of eBay's will be mobile based, which is, if you think about it, insane. Um, Facebook 
This is a bit dated because now it's around 50%, but you know, here's a, here's a, a big growing public company. 40-50% um, of their active users are on mobile which is why there's so much effort on making sure the experience on mobile is as good or better than it was on the PC. Because if that's, that's as again, where, what Wayne Gretzky said, you have to you know, be where your customer wants to be. Um, and Amazon, as I mentioned, uh, two thirds now of all their books are shipped on, on, the, on the Kindle. Are you all getting a, a trend here? All right, um, I'm going to pause a bit. I want to show you sort of what we've done in the area of, of retail with a, a little bit of a demo and why it's working, why it's popular. Um, but uh, let me pause and see if there's any, any questions before I just ramble on. I don't know. I can... I can So, so the question was, well, why does the iPhone, and, and, or I'll just extend the question, or the iPad as, as an extension uh, dominate, if you will, Android-based uh, traffic, even though Android units are shipping at a substantially higher rate? I have only theories uh, to that, and I'll just share them with you for whatever they're worth. Uh, one is the user experience on an Apple device, as reported by the end users themselves, tends to be more seamless. So. You know, it's easy to shop between or jump between the stores or and the applications, maybe. Uh, there's some truth to that. The other thing is that, especially on the phone side of the business, the uh, smartphones that are Android-based are more heavily subsidized. And so they're penetrating into uh, areas of the market where they're, they're being sold as a smartphone, but they're being used as a feature phone. So people are calling them. They're using the phone quite a bit, but they're using it to call. They're not, they're not downloading apps, or they haven't been to date. Clearly, that's going to change. To date, downloading apps and using the data traffic as much as the iPhone uh, users. And so maybe the subsidy allows a greater audience share to participate in that, but they may not be as technically savvy or whatever it is, and they're not using the, the, um, uh, the data traffic as much. And it's, it's still stunning because... I talk to, if you, if you throw out the tablet traffic and you talk to retailers, the iPhone, which is one model basically, it is everything else combined in terms of traffic. So if you add in the Android tablets and you add in um, the Android phones in terms of data traffic, it's everything else combined if you throw out all the tablet stuff. So those are my theories, my speculation. I think it's going to change. Um, anyways, any, any other? Question. Yep. Done. You, the PC, you mean like laptop or desk computers, right? Yeah. And uh, do you think that? Uh, and according to your statistics, and uh, we can see like lots of people buying like tablets or smartphone now. Yeah. yeah. But do you think uh, there's a reason that people already have PC in their home? Maybe one more or more. So that's a reason that they don't do not want PC anymore. So they would choose like tablet. Because it's new. I mean, yeah, if, no, there's, there's definitely some, something to that. I, I think. mean, if for one person he doesn't have a computer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if it's the first time for him to buy a like, uh, PC or tablet, mm -hmm. you think he would choose tablet over PC? Well, uh, recently the trend has definitely been to choose tra uh, tablet. So, you know, is the, is the question, I think the question is leading one to believe is there a little bit of a novelty that's allowing these the devices to ship in higher quantities? Or is there going to be a product refresh on the PC side maybe a year from now with Windows 8 or something that allows higher volumes of PCs? I, so my personal opinion is that uh, the, the majority of people aren't using a great deal of applications. They simply need internet connectivity. They need email services. They, you know, I, I know we're in university and we're not, this is not the standard audience. This is not representative of the country. But, a word processor is already getting too sophisticated for the average user. They just need it as a communication device. Um, and a lot of these word processors, by the way, today are available in the cloud. Right? So you can access Google in the cloud on your pad, and you don't need to worry about updates. You don't need to worry. So I, I believe that it's not just a novelty. It's just because for the average user, 
it, they're satisfied with the apps they have on these sort of devices. And there you go. The fastest growing consumers for, for these devices today, when it started, it was basically men in their early 20s. That was the majority. There's a lot of things that PC can do, but tablets cannot. No, they can't do it. That's true. They can't do it because the software doesn't allow you to do it. But if you looked at the, the Windows introduction of their Surface tablet, mm -hmm. that's a Windows 8 machine. That'll do everything you want. You need a keyboard, it has a keyboard. You need a bigger screen, it has an HDMI output. You need, okay, so I, I, I remember these arguments, just to backtrack, I remember these arguments with regards to the laptop. This was a toy. Mm -hmm. Why would you use this as opposed to a desktop? People were buying desktops all the time because desktops could do more and tablets, I mean, sorry, the, uh, laptops only had two hours of battery life if you, were ha if you were lucky, didn't have the processing capability, the screen wasn't bright enough, and it took seven years for the, the laptop to finally beat out the desktop. Mm -hmm. Now if you, look at, if you look at the industry, people are selling way more laptops than desktops. My, my, my belief is that once the software, to your point, once the productivity apps catch up here, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it. As long as you can access your software, I, I don't see it. So one thing when I look at when I look at catalog spree that, that comes to mind immediately is elegance. I mean, I look back to the 1800s when you were talking mm -hmm. about the catalogs and how they were big and mm -hmm. they showed a lot of detail and a lot of variety and it was just dedicated mm -hmm. to hundreds and hundreds of pages. Mm -hmm. Most often if you thought about the old Sears catalog mm -hmm. or Spiegel big. or one yeah. of those. Um, you don't have those problems in terms of um, depth. I mean, you can, you can yeah. have a lot of content. What I'm interested in is the idea of elegance and how that works for your brand. Okay. Um, so I think that's, the, that's I think where the differentiator is because we're going up against, if you will, from a use case perspective, uh, companies like Amazon and other you know, retailers that have been on the web now for 10, maybe 15 years. And it's hard to compete against them. And the way those retailers work, and they're perfectly decent retailers, and they, I think, have a long history ahead of them, they work not on the, if you will, the elegance principle necessarily. They work on the efficiency principle first. And it's what, they, what the, the mechanism or the behavior they've targeted uh, is basically search, find, maybe compare, and buy. So it's search, find, buy, search, find, buy. It's not uh, immerse yourself, discover, engage with the retailer and do, if you will, that sort of casual, uh, what they call couch commerce experience. So we are not necessarily about optimizing that search, find, buy experience. We're about optimizing the, if you will, what you said, if you will, the elegance, the, the casual um, and uh, more uh, interactive, if you will, experience. So let me just boot up uh, my Tablet, see. So I'll just transition to the demo portion. So uh, this is Catalog Spree. This is running off of uh, my my iPad. Um, as you see here, it shows you some specials that are running from retailers, like in this case Eddie Bauer. It also shows you what the newest catalogs are. Allows you to pick whatever recommended catalogs are shot by departments. All you have to do is touch anything, and it'll start showing you the catalog. Let me just hit see all. So I hit see all with my finger. And here is my, if you will, my library of catalogs. And I can just go through. Now, the reason we picked this use case is one, this, if you will, this elegant use case, or what I call this sort of browse, discover, and engage use case, um, is not something that anyone has done well at, ever, on this. So one thing is when you innovate, do not try to just do what someone else has done for 15 years. Do something different. Um, and you're able to touch on any particular uh, catalog. And I didn't download. You didn't see there was like a 20 minute download to download the entire Patagonia, um, which by the way was a normal use case even two years ago. You would just download a massive PDF file. Um, and you could just flip through anything. If you need to pinch and zoom, you can create your little magnifying glass there and see anything you need to. If you need to touch on any, you know, get more, and I have this in Spanish format, that's why you have the uh, funky commas as opposed to the dots, so I have my iPad and 
in Spanish. So that's why you have the $349 written that way. So you can you know, see more details uh, of this product just by touching the product. Um, you can favorite it and add it to any list that you like. Well, for baby, that's not for baby. That's uh, maybe for favorites. Um, I can share it with my Facebook friends just by hitting uh, share, and it'll connect me to Facebook, and I'm not going to wait for Facebook to wake up, but I can share this on Facebook, which is, again, part of this new media. Everything has to be socially connected. The, reason, the way I get discovered is by having some sort of socially relevant or interest relevant link to somebody or something that I care about. So immersing or, or, or elevating, if you will, that message is very important, which is why Pinterest is there as well. I can pin this uh, on Pinterest and put it on my pin board. Uh, the product, the, it's 502, that's interesting. Uh, or I can do the old fashioned thing, which is just email it to somebody. Um, so that's a one-on-one -on -one communication. So I, I can do that, or e even crazier, I could just hit uh, see details, and I can just purchase this from the retailer. So now, unlike Amazon, which is a store, we're more of a, the best analogy would be we're more of a mall. So we have all these retailers in there, and this is Patagonia site. This is not Catalog Spree site. I've just sent you to Patagonia site, and you're able to you know, purchase the product uh, directly uh, from that. And you're able to you know, continue you know, looking at Anything that you like, we, ha we have embedded video here as well. You can keep on going back and forth to see details. You can see your history on your left-hand nav. That left-hand nav is basically us. Everything else in there is Patagonia's. And you can you know, do your checkout, purchase anything you like. And you can engage in different views. So if you're a lady and you want to just see anything in women's apparel, you can just switch to the department's view and just hit apparel. And you can see all the apparel um, items that are there. Um, let's see, any favorites in here? Let's see, well, LLB LL Bean is uh, somewhat new onto the platform. And here you have a main retailer selling just gorgeous stuff uh, over here. So yeah, we're very focused on that engage paradigm. So much so that these aren't just words. Uh, the average user on one of our retailers' uh, web pages engaged in a you know, typical search find buy experience, staying four minutes on their website. The average user on a weekend on our app, on the iPad, is staying for 44 minutes. That's the average. And if you get to the winter and you go to Chicago, all the way from Chicago to Washington State, they're staying above an hour on a single sitting. So this is more about that retail entertainment and that social commerce experience uh, that, we are, that, we're, that we're doing. You, you had a question? Yes, I want to ask you about well, you, you have your application for uh, all Apple devices yeah. in the App Store. Are you going to have anything for Surface or Android tablets? Because I see that they have to go through your website or online to, to do it. And as you said, users are increasing in Android platforms. And yeah. of course, I think that there will be a lot of users that will enjoy Surface. Yeah, so I think uh, next year we'll start to see that. So the answer is, uh, in terms of, for today, um, binary specific, software, it's only for the iPad. But if you wanted to access it from a Kindle, which people do, or from an Android tablet, which people do, about 15% about, uh, of our users are on those devices, you go, to the, you go to your browser. So let's just bring up uh, Safari. So imagine this was the uh, Kindle, um, the Kindle uh, browser. And you just top in, you type in, does everyone know what uh, HTML5 is? There's a sort of a web standard that's used for interactive web. So you type in shop dot catalog spree dot com and you hit go. And on your uh, Android device or your Kindle or you know whatever it, it may be, uh, you get a web experience. So this is the web. And you can see that it mimics this, uh, it mimics, mimics the iPad quite a bit. So you hit, the, for example, departments over here. And this view should be similar to what you've seen before. You can scroll up and down. You hit apparel. So this is all done on the web. Do you have uh, information about, does it change the user experience from web to application? Oh, yeah. Application? Uh, so on the iPad, the, as I mentioned, the typical use on the weekend is about 44 minutes. During the month, just average everything, it's about 30 minutes for each visit by each individual user. 
um, during the month, we're getting the average user to spend over 100 mis minutes inside the app, which if you've seen a, another new media play is called uh, Flipboard, I'm not sure how many, which aggregates news services and, pro you know, and provides it in a, and Facebook and Twitter and provides it in a very sort of casual browsing experience. You know, their average for the month is 84. We're averaging 90. Most of our users are clearly women. Um, and we can, I can give you demographics, but in terms of, yeah, they, they'll stay twice as long on this site as they do on an average retailer site. So it's about eight and a half minutes, but it's still not 44 minutes that's on the iPad. Um, and you know, what, what, here's one thing that's amazing. So we expected that when we launched this site that the majority of traffic would be from Windows machines and a small sliver, about 7%, a little growing, on Macintosh, and then just a small wedge, maybe 20%, would be from other, including iPads, not the app, but the Safari, or, okay, on the weekend, 50% of the traffic is from Windows plus Mac. The other 50% is from Android plus iPad plus iPhone. So already half the traffic is from, <clears throat> now two thirds of that half is from iOS devices, is from Apple land. Again, to the question that was asked earlier, the, the people on iDevices I are spending a lot of time. And about a third of that mobile traffic today is uh, a third of that, yeah, a third of that piece is from an um, Android device. Those numbers are going to change. Um, but anyways, that's how it's being done today. All right, um, I could show you more of the application, but uh, I think you, you got the gist. The, here it is. It's more of a couch commerce um, uh, experience. Uh, and by the way, we noticed a different behavior. So as I mentioned, we launched about uh, 17 uh, months ago. Uh, we noticed specifically different behavior on Thanksgiving Day uh, versus the Friday, so the, the next day after Thanksgiving, versus what I called in the press Sofa Sunday versus Cyber Monday. So there was radically different behavior. So at night, after people were ingesting their, their bird, um, there was a lot of time spent all the way past midnight on the iPad, sort of, if you will, collecting a list, you know, being inspired what it is that I want to get for whomever. And then on Saturday, a, sorry, on Friday, boof, people were gone. There was not that much traffic. Where were they? They were in the bloody stores. They were, they were all you know, going crazy, going to the stores, getting the specials that were on, on that uh, Black Friday. And then Sunday, the traffic was just, it was the biggest spike we'd ever seen un until that point. People were relaxing, they were back, getting ready for preparing their list to shop while they were at work the next day at their, at their PCs. Um, anyways, there's tremendous amounts of data that we have uh, with respect to user behavior on this. And by the way, our web traffic is significantly different than our iPad app traffic. Our web traffic is pretty steady throughout the entire week. There's no difference between Monday uh, and Sunday in general. Uh, during the workday, we see people using it. On the iPad, very few people are using it uh, before the workday is done. Then they get home, and there's a spike at 6 p.m. almost every day of the week at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. You basically have an aggregated mass of prime time viewers that are in front of their TV consuming a lot of time on our tablet. And it's again, it's that, that uh, couch commerce experience. They're, they're on that, whereas uh, again, on the web, it's pretty f straight the whole, the whole time. Basically uh, after 8 a.m. Eastern, all the way till about 1 a.m. Um, Pacific, there's a pretty consistent amount of uh, traffic. In terms of uh, points that matter, I'll just uh, try to wrap up with a few things that uh, I, I've learned. Um, we're an application, we launched this uh, type of experience on the iPad in April of last year, 2011. The first of its, real, of the, of its kind, really. Um, and uh, so a couple of things happened. Apple has added one category to the App Store since we launched, and that was catalogs. All right, now there's thousands, thousands of uh, catalog applications. And why would that be? It happens that catalogs is the third largest publication industry in the United States. There were 20 billion catalogs shipped, not in the universe, just in the United States. It's a massive publication industry. Um, so 
how is this that this little company from you know this Silicon Valley funded company in Los Altos because we couldn't afford the Palo we had to be in Los Altos uh, which by the way is a nice town so is anyone from Los Altos we enjoy being there um, how is it that uh, we've gotten there uh, versus there are other apps that launch for example Google Google catalogs has their own app and we have roughly according to our retail partners around six times not 60% more six times the traffic that uh, Google has and I, I think it's the first one user experience unless you have a good user experience the easiest thing to do is ignore or delete the app and you're done you're never going to see it again boom you're done um, so I think in this new world what you called elegance before what I'll call user experience um, it's of paramount importance we saw that to some extent uh, with the uh, web and web 2.0 uh, sites uh, that there's there's definitely a lot of design again most of those sites were were more geared toward uh, optimizing the engagement not necessarily you know um, Facebook is an exception not necessarily uh, making it uh, more optimal for just uh, casual browsing but user experience is, is important so you know we spend a lot of time looking at every detail and it's I'm very proud of what we have we will continue to whittle away at that uh, at that application so um, we hire graphic designers we hire we bring in uh, mostly women um, because women represent 75 percent of all everything that's purchased in this country so women women rule um, we bring in women uh, we bring in women to take a look at uh, what the different options are in front of them and to let's let them explore and get feedback as to what works what doesn't work you know what they're engaged with um, so we spend a lot of time on user experience the next thing that you sp we spend a lot of time and why we've added things like Facebook and Pinterest and all sorts of connectivity is the it has to be sticky and part of that stickiness is it has to become socially relevant it has to you ha we have to bring you back into the application or or your friends have to bring you back somebody's got to bring you back into the application or into the, the website. So you spend a lot of time not just building a functional experience, but a sticky experience. Um, content is very important. When we started, we had seven retailers. There were seven catalogs. You started the application, there were seven catalogs. When Google started, they started with 120. Um, they started a few months after we did, and they're Google. Um, you have to keep on adding relevant content, uh, especially if you're trying to target a particular demographic. Um, so content is important and lastly awareness is important and there's a couple ways of doing awareness I mean getting on we were just on the NBC Today show when we won the iVillage award so that was important we were on the Ellen the generous show last uh, the Christmas show the first day of Christmas last uh, last year in 2011 which was fantastic but even more important than that is again back to the social it's a new media world you have to build in social signals social cues or at least interest cues into your application and augment that as much as possible. Don't make them annoying, because that, that's another thing. You can go too far, and then people are like, all right, I, you know, I've been hit by too many emails from this damn company, um, or they po posted uh, too many times on my wall. I'm just going to get them off. But it's important to build in uh, viral awareness. Um, anyways, a little more sort of marketing material with regards to us. As uh, Calvin had mentioned, we, again, this small company in Los Altos is doing well in terms of we get a lot of downloads and we're the number one rated catalog app out there here's all sorts of demographic information that we have in here this is something that you should pay attention to for example if you're building a media experience you have to be aware of what time and in what situation are your users likely is this going to be a casual experience for example on a phone if you design an app for the phone it's a lot different than if you're designing it for a bigger screen like this this is more of a one to two minute update me maybe do a little search maybe say oh Joey just shared with me some, something from Patagonia, and we're done. Um, or I got, a, I got an incentive to buy something because I just walked into Macy's. Um, uh, on the pad, it's a much different experience. So you have to pay attention to the data, which means you have to instrument everything you do. There's a lot of artistry behind what you're doing in terms of the graphic user interface, but you have to scientifically instrument everything you do and have someone analyze the numbers to death. <clears throat> in terms of where this is being consumed so before uh, this is a connected world before you would just target New York City Los Angeles uh, Chicago 
couple of cities in Texas, and you know you would hit the majority market. What we're seeing here is well, you know, New York and and uh, and California are doing quite well, but number two is Texas. Texas is smaller than New York. Texas should be number three. We're getting a lot of people in the center of the country using a, a god awful amount of data on this. It's, it's just tremendous. Up the entire <coughs> Mississippi, all the way to Minnesota, it's crazy. The iPad and interconnected web devices have definitely penetrated the entire country and they're penet penetrating the, the planet. So keep, keep, a, you know, keep in mind where your users are. And you can see wildly different stats. I mean, California you would expect to be number one because it's the most populous state. Um, but you know, some of these things, like Florida, is number four. Well, OK, you wouldn't have expected that. And in terms of usage, so this is uh, data from April of last year. Um, Hawaii, you know, the average session throughout the entire month was 35 minutes. Well, we get and, you know, West Virginia. All right, well, what is that about? Well, there's not Fifth Avenue in Hawaii, and the Fifth Avenue doesn't exist in West Virginia. In fact, if I go 50 miles outside of New York City to White Plains or to Greenwich, you're going to spend 25% longer in this app because you don't have the capability of just walking out the door and visiting these sites for real. So we're giving you that, if you will, that virtual window shopping experience. So the only reason we know this is because we've instrumented everything to death. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, I'll just say that uh, in this media space, it's all about growth. We're still in the early days. So this is like 1994 all over again. If you remember 94 with the advent of web, the web and the browser and you know, people starting to grow on services like Yahoo. Um, I don't know how many people here use Yahoo. But, um, and then later on in 96, 97, Google, uh, you have to, it has to be about growth. It has to be about that engagement. Uh, we, ban we began the company, and I thought we would stay with like three people for a while, maybe seven to eight people. Okay, we're almost at 20 people, and we're still hiring. We can't keep up. We, have, we're, we publish now five catalogs a day on average, where before we started with just seven. Um, so today we just published, I think, 12. Um, <coughs> and there's growth in the number of retailers. started with seven retailers. We have 260 live catalogs representing 150 retailers. Uh, today, so you have to keep your eye on growth. For example, why did Facebook make it and some other services not make it on the social front? It's about growth. It's, you're going to connect with uh, your friends on the platform that has the most users. That's just, uh, that's why one system beats another um, if there's competing systems. And uh, visibility, um, you know, it's great to get the visibility, it's great to get the media attention, but uh, it's even more important that the users that use these services in the new media space become their own advocates, become their own editors, become their own style, stylists, if you will. And then you get, uh, you get uh, repeat usage. All right, thanks. Any questions? <laughs> Any other questions? We're going to get one, then you get. He's got one, then I'll get the second one. Um, so, you know, talking about the business model a little bit, <coughs> and, uh, do you work with, you have account executives, and then you seek out companies and say, hey, we know you have catalogs, obviously. Come put your catalog on catalog spree, and then what, what is, how, does, how do those relationships work? How does your relationship with the actual businesses, how has that been? So it's, uh, it's been uh, variable, let's just say. Um, there are some companies that are, especially the, some of the smaller to mid-sized companies, they rush to these new platforms because they know they need to have a distribution advantage versus some of the household names. Um, there are others who, become, who are technical thought leaders who are always, that's part of their DNA. Like for example, uh, well, I think Nordstrom's falls in that category. They, when we started, they were amongst the first three to sign up. They were like, okay, we're going to take advantage of this because we're going to at least learn. Um, but we still have companies who are, you know, shipping, I uh, won't name names, but they're shipping at a drop $60 million worth of books every time they se send a, a new book, and it's all paper, which is fine. Paper drives this, the desired behavior in terms of, the com uh, of, of their consumers, but there's a new medium. So it's variable. By the way, we've done all of this with one salesperson. So there's only one salesperson. There's not like an army of people 
uh, doing this. There's one salesperson. I do it part time, but we have one dedicated salesperson that's done all this. Um, you know, we use all the tools that are on a, you know, to our disposition. For example, we use um, we do screen sharing across the country, and you know, I'll be on the phone with Neiman Marcus or with whomever, and I'll just show them what's going on with the latest build and. And we also sold them the stats. You know, we said, okay, the average user is on our site for 44 minutes. Um, do you want to capture some of those? Um, so we've done it uh, that way. But I, I, back to your original, it's variable. There's, there are some people who are actively resisting it, actively. And there's other people who are, uh, if you will, thought leaders. And they're, it's just still early days. Again, this is 94 again, if you will, if you take the analogy. And they're just learning along uh, with us what works and what doesn't work. But clearly, what we've shown is that this is a viable mechanism to distribute uh, material. You had a quick one? Uh, yeah. I, was I was looking through your digital mall here, mm -hmm. and you have different apartments. Basically, it's like shoes, beauty, and yeah. jewelry, clothes, everything. My question is, like, how, how bas I don't think you have, like, factory to produce those. How do you cooperate with different stores? I mean, it, it's all, again, we're, if I interpret the question correctly, uh, we, are, we are not the manufacturer. We are not even the store. We're the, if you will, this digital mall. No. Everybody, so we hit shoes. Uh, Hush Puppies will come up. Nordstrom will come up. It's all about the end retailer that we're, we're pushing directly to them. So as opposed to Amazon, uh -huh. Amazon is a store. They, they may not be the manufacturer. They may be sourcing these materials from other stores. Uh -huh. That's not our model. Our model is to more represent the brands behind uh, those categories and allow those brands to, if you will. So we talk to every one of them? Like, oh, there is a... I talk, well, I talk to hundreds, hundreds of them. There's, so there's, they would like to join you? Like, oh, we can... There, in, just in this country, we could hit 5,000 easily retailers that would, that would join this. So, yeah, at this point, we're still in early days. As I mentioned, we have 100, 150. Uh, 250 catalogs live, we could hit 5,000. We're just scratching the surface at this point. Um, I was wondering if you guys have ever approached the Jay Peterman catalog? Oh man, I would, yeah. Um, well, let's just say I fantasize about it just because of Seinfeld. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, if anyone at Jay Peterman uh, approaches me, I would be happy to chat with them. And not because of a business, just because of a childhood fantasy regarding Seinfeld and Elaine and everyone fighting in that office. And yeah, so I would love to have them. I know. I think people, your, um, the minutes spent on your site would go up because their descriptions. Oh, their descriptions <laughs> are phenomenal. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, so no is the answer, but uh, it is a private, personal fantasy of mine. Question here. Um, do you partner with companies that don't have a physical location? Because I know there's a lot of catalogs there that. Yes, exist. in fact, uh, there's a, somewhere in the 30 to 40 percent of our catalogs don't have physical stores. Okay. Um, some of them have just a few stores, but they distribute most of it via either wholesalers or catalogs uh, or the internet. Uh, but yeah, we do. And uh, you will be seeing very soon here in the month of November some retailers that uh, weren't even in existence just uh, three years ago, four years ago, this new retailers that are emerging because of the, um, the power of the internet that uh, didn't have a single store or a single catalog. So anyways. All right, one more? All right. Uh, I guess you need to come up with uh, new ideas every moment, so is there any, anything you keep in mind doing job, during doing job? Is, is there any belief? Is there any new what? Be belief? Um, well, I struggle with this uh, a lot. Uh, you know, we, we only have 20 people in the company, roughly. Um, so, and we're not Google, so we just can't throw bodies at everything. So. I mean, we get together every week for several hours, sometimes painfully, sometimes uh, enthusiastically, and we fight over what are the new things we need to concentrate on. Like, what are the tools, for example, we have to give to retailers in terms of analytic tools that make this, you know, worth their while. Um, there's a lot of time that's spent on the consumer, on the user of the application. 
I won't give anything away here. Um, there's, like I said, if we were the only app of this type, that's fine. But there's thousands of competitors. But um, there's a lot more that will happen on the social front. Uh, there's a lot more that, back to the question from over here from before, there's a lot more retailers that will start to appear on this app that you wouldn't have thought they were retailers. Um, you know, they have lots of content, but you wouldn't have thought of them as retailers. And um, so that, that makes it exciting for me because uh, anyone that represents content can represent a purchasing opportunity. And um, uh, you'll be seeing some of that in the next just couple of months. All right, thanks. You got one? Okay. One more. I, uh, you know, when we look at an industry like retail, you know, it's very well established, sometimes it's not as quick to react. How do you go about taking those industries? You know, some, we kind of look at this with newspapers often in the media and forcing them to adapt to this new media. How do you go about that adaptation process? You, you spend time with those that are, uh, that are um, how would I say, predisposed to try new things. Like some of the retailers we have, like Wolverine Shoes, they've been around for 120 years. But it's in their DNA. They're going to try new things all the time. So when they went to mail order, they did mail order first. This was a long time ago. When they went to the 1-800 phone number system, they went to 1-800 phone number so that you can do the call and ordering. So I try to, in the first half hour or less, determine who am I talking to. Am I talking to somebody in the company that's the right person? Uh, if not, then that's, that's okay. We'll have the conversation and say, okay, who is the right person? Or is the retailer as a... You know, as an entity, are they, are, they, are they just kicking tires? They're just trying to learn, but they're not necessarily serious. So we, we try to home in on the people who, who are predisposed to want to do this. And then, you know, for example, when, you, when Apple launched the iBook store, when Amazon launched uh, the Kindle store, not every single publisher in the United States was like, oh, yeah, we'll give all our business to you. Sure, that, you know, that works. Um, the music industry was a little different, um, but even... Even though there were, there were a couple of labels that held out, and there were definitely groups like the Beatles that, that held out for a long time. Um, so we go to those that have a natural proclivity to want to try to something. Because it's not like we have the answer to everything. We don't know exactly how this is going to play out. I have a vision. I know it's in the, going in this direction. But um, there's a lot of time that can be wasted on stuff that isn't productive. So, and there's... Fortunately for us, we're, we live in the United States, same could be said for Western Europe, where there's, there's a big market and there's a lot of people that you can choose from, and so you, you pick your battles, I guess. Again, we're only 20 people and one salesperson. We don't have, there's only 24 hours we have to play around with. All right? Well, thanks a lot. Thank you, Joaquin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joaquin. Appreciate it. Uh, just a quick note regarding our next speaker. Next Tuesday, same time, same location, uh, Alan Enemark from uh, Elemental 8 will be our interactive uh, designer talking about what it takes to be a designer in new media. And once again, same, same room, 6 o'clock next Tuesday. Yeah, check out our website, new, newmediavisionaries.org, and you can get the details on uh, the next week's speaker as well as uh, future speakers. Great, thank you.